Chapter 2, Lesson 3 of Precalculus, we're going to look at polynomial functions of higher degree with modeling. We've looked at quadratics, those are x squared functions. We want to look now at um, functions with a third degree, fourth degree, fifth degree, and even higher. We want to look at the graphs of these polynomial functions, what the graphs look like. We'll look at the end behavior and how we can determine those, and then we'll also look at the zeros of the polynomial functions as well. But we want to look at some vocabulary first, and there's four vocabulary words here in this little paragraph. Each monomial in the sum is a term of the polynomial. We talked about in the last lesson about a single term being a monomial, and polynomial functions are just a sum or an adding together of more than one monomial function. So you have an x squared, and then you're going to add that to an x, and then you're going to add that to a constant. Or we're going to have an uh, x to the fourth, we're going to add that to an x to the cubed, x to the cubed, x cubed, add that to an x squared, add that to an x. So you have these individual monomials all added together making up a polynomial. Now when we have all of these monomials put together in a, in a uh, uh, adding them we want to put them in standard form and in standard form we have the highest degree one first then the next highest degree then the next highest degree. The numbers in front of these uh, variables are called coefficients and then the the one that ends up in the front when it's in standard form which is the highest um, exponent one is called the leading term of the polynomial now the constant term ends up being the y-intercept then for every polynomial function because you think about the y-intercept that's f of zero substituting in zero if we put zero in for every x value all of these other terms are going to end up being zero except for the constant so the constant term in a standard form uh, polynomial is going to be your y-intercept. Now all polyno polynomial functions are defined and continuous for all real numbers, meaning there's no break. So there is no, uh, there are no asymptotes, there are no uh, breaks in the graph either for the domain or the range. So they're defined and continuous for all real numbers, which means, again, they're going to be smooth, unbroken lines or curves. They're going to be continuous. So all polynomial functions are continuous. We want to look now at graphing these combinations of monomial functions. So we're adding all of these monomial functions together. What are some of the characteristics of the graph? Now there's a discussion on page 201 and example 2 of this. And if you want to take a look at that, that will help give you a little bit more background on what I'm talking about. But in that example, what we learn is that the graphs of these combination functions look like the leading terms graph. In other words, the term that's in the front, the x cubed or the x to the fourth or x to the fifth, the entire graph kind of ends up looking like one of those on what that graph would look like, and all of these other terms in the middle affect around what happens around the zeros or where it crosses the x-axis. So this is very important. When you have a multiple uh, functions being added together, multiple monomials, so you have this polynomial function, the general shape of the graph is going to be determined by the largest exponents graph. Whatever that graph normally looks like, that's what the entire graph will generally look like. Around the zeros, or where it crosses or touches the x-axis, that's where the other terms start affecting the graph. Okay, so it's very important, those two characteristics, and that's pretty much how we're going to attack graphing these. We're going to look at the ends of the graph, or the general shape, by looking at the leading term, and then we're going to look at the zeros, where it crosses or touches the x-axis, and then we're going to uh, combine all those in a smooth curve. So that discussion, if you want to look at that. So when we're looking at these functions, we're going to look at specifically cubic and quartics because they generally define the behavior, what happens with every function in their group, meaning cubic functions will kind of give us a picture at what happens on the end for all functions that have a highest exponent that's odd. So third, x to the fifth, x to the seventh, x to the ninth, any of those, the general shape of those are all going to be the same. And for quartics, they're pretty much looking like anything with an even. So a uh, fourth, a sixth, x to the eighth, a tenth. The general shape of the ends is going to be dictated by those values, and they're all going to look pretty much the same. So if you look at the cubic function here, you'll notice that if you used a horizontal line as the x-axis, how many zeros can a cubic function have? So if we take a uh, horizontal line, so let's go ahead and do that. We take a horizontal line here, 
and we move that around and we can put this, this, this imagine that this is our x-axis and we moved it up or down here looking at that what are the most zeros that a cubic function could have in other words how many times at most can a cubic function cross the x-axis well no matter where I put it the most times I can get it to cross is would be right here three times okay so if we move that over to a quartic how many times, what's the most times a quartic could cross? Well, here, if I put it right here on this quartic right here, you'll notice it crosses one, two, three, four times. So a quartic can cross the x-axis at most four times. Now, it doesn't have to, because you'll notice here it only crosses twice, here it only crosses twice. But the most I can make it cross is four times. And with a cubic, the most I can make it cross is three times. Now, again, it doesn't have to, but at most it's going to cross it three times. If we're looking at the minimum and maximum, the number of places that it can be minimum or maximum, how many mins or max could a cubic function have at most? Well, here, here's a max here and a min here, so that's two. Then there's no way for me to make it have more than two. Uh, same thing here, here's a minimum, here's a maximum, there's no way for me to make it have more than two. If we take a look at the quartic, which is a fourth uh, degree, notice I have three. I have a minimum here, a maximum here, and another minimum, so I can make it have three total, but I can never have make it have more than that. So if we just kind of take that and put that in uh, a theorem almost, this is what we come up with. If you're taking a look at a polynomial function that has a degree n, and n could be any number, okay, the most extremas that you can have are one less than the degree. So a third degree can only have two maximum or minimums. A fourth degree can only have three maximum or minimums. A fifth can only have four maximum or minimums at the most. But the number of zeros that it has or the number of times it can cross or touch the x-axis is going to be equal to the degree. So a third degree can cross or touch the x-axis in three places. Doesn't have to again, but these are the most. All right? So that's kind of a little exercise or a little um, introduction to these polynomial functions. We'll take a look more in detail uh, at those as we uh, pick up on the next video.